As we have seen during the second week of this course, the principles of speciality and conferral are basic principles of the law of international organizations. International organizations are each established for specific purposes. They receive competences from their member states and their legal personality is accordingly limited. And despite their similarities, international organizations are different by their respective purposes and institutional frameworks. In some organizations, organs are established to embody the organization and they are each differently tasked. Sometimes those organs are conferred a law-making capacity. In other words, the basic instrument establishing the organization creates a typology of juridical acts that the organization is entitled to adopt through its various organs. The basic instrument will also detail the procedure for the adoption of those acts and the legal effect they have for the member states of the organization and eventually also the effect they have on the individuals and the corporations within those member states. Those acts are unilateral acts of the international organization and their basic legal effect is determined by the basic instrument. When unilateral acts of the organization are binding, they are sometimes referred to as forming together a body of rules called secondary legislation of the organization of the internal law or internal rules of the organization. And the European Union offers the most striking example of an organization entitled to adopt regulations, directives and decisions legally binding on its member states and eventually also on the citizens of the Union. As a matter of principle, this does not raise any theoretical problem. The founding members of the organization have consented to its basic instrument, knowing that under that instrument the organization could, according to the conditions stated therein, take the binding measures uh, uh, and those measures being binding on them. The consent given to the basic instrument and therefore to the rules it contains for the creation of unilateral acts by the organization, that consent explains why the binding character of those acts exists as determined by the, ba the basic instrument. It does not contradict the principle of state sovereignty. Thus, unilateral acts of international organizations derive from their respective basic instruments and are subordinated to it. They take their binding force from the basic instrument, which in turn, as a treaty, takes its binding force from consent given to it. Two considerations follow from this basic articulation between the treaty establishing the organization and the unilateral acts adopted thereunder. One, because unilateral acts of international organizations derive from and are subordinated to the basic instrument establishing the organization, their validity depends on the, their conformity with the rules and the procedures established under the basic instrument for their adoption. In other words, there is a hierarchy between the basic instrument and the secondary legislation and the latter must conform with the former. If unilateral acts do not conform with the basic instrument, they should be considered as null and void and therefore deprived of any legal effect. Sometimes a court is established within the organization to adjudicate on the validity of its secondary legislation and this is the case, for instance, with the European Court of Justice as the Court of the European Union. Two, there is not only a normative chain of validity between the basic instrument establishing the organization and the unilateral acts adopted by the organization under the basic instrument. The same normative chain also creates a continuity between the legal nature of the basic treaty and the secondary legislation. If the treaty establishing the organization has an international legal character, 
then the unilateral acts of the organization will share the same legal nature. In other words, they will also be considered, from the point of view of international law, as instruments of international law, as sources of international law. And the next reading will illustrate that last point.